around in, in, in August, late July, early August, they put out the apportionment, because that's the primary purpose of the census uh, originally under the Constitution was to apportion Congress. And so, you know, they sent out, you, you probably saw newspaper articles about how, you know, California for the first time in its history lost seats in Congress and Texas picked up seats and Florida picked up seats, et cetera. Louisiana, thankfully, did not lose a seat this time. We have in the past, but we did not. So then the next step is to actually release what's called the PL data, the very granular census block data down to the states. And that's the data that's actually utilized for, for to draw census. Like I said, normally, 10 years ago, we got that in late February, early March of the year following the census. This time, we did not get it in that March or April. We didn't get it until September, which was much later than we ordinarily get it. Now, malapportionment. All right, one of the utilize, uh, purposes for the census is to essentially allow for you to draw single-member districts that have, have approximately equal population. And the notion being, I try to explain to people like this. If you had... District A had 10,000 people in it. District B had 5,000 people in it, but they each only got to elect one council member. Well, that would mean the people in District B would effectively have twice the voting power. So that's why you try to get those districts approximately equal. Um, and that's what you do. You take the 2020 census data, we did, we took it, we went and input it into our uh, mapping software with your current districts. That's the districts they all ran on four years ago to see whether the districts had uh, the population of district districts were malapportioned. And in fact, they did turn out to be. Malapportioned means are the districts more than plus or minus 5% off the ideal? The ideal is pretty simple math. You take the population of the parish divided by the number of districts. Now, you do have to look, when you look at it, uh, like I said, with some, sometimes you have to redact out inmates if you're housing state inmates who are felons and they're serving felony time. They, they're constitutionally, they can't vote in this election. So, depending upon how large that number is. Sometimes you redact out, sometimes you don't. Here, it was statistically relevant. It would have thrown off that one man, one vote calculation. For example, last year, uh, last cycle, we did the city of New Orleans. It was one of our clients. Well, a, a district in a city council district was 60 plus thousand people. So the thousand people at the Paris Jail was statistic. It didn't have a st statistical impact on the overall number. So there was no reason to redact out. But in, in case, we did. So we made the determination that they were in fact Malapportioned. We submitted that report. The council actually adopted an ordinance to that effect, which is a, a requirement of state law. All right. Now, there we go. All right. Now that is a look at the districts as they uh, existed in, in pursuant to the. Uh, let's see. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, a look at the districts as they existed. Like I said. This is the malapportionment base report that we sent. You see that number to the far right column? See all those double digits? All of those need to be within plus or minus five. So district one, district two, they're all way out of that plus or minus five. So they were clearly malapportioned. Now, I mentioned the inmate population. We contacted uh, through the sheriff's department, were provided the DOC inmate population. And these are not the people who are in jail for until they make bail because they hadn't been tried. Those people are able to vote even when they're in jail. They can get a ballot. It's those felons who are serving Department of Corrections time through the state of Louisiana who are actually just being housed there. So they don't, they're not really part of the parish. They're just being housed there. It was 468. You redact those out. So you see what it did. It actually made the malapportionment problem in District 1 even worse um, because that's the numbers we then utilized for determining how each district was apportioned. And you notice it reduced the – we affected by reducing the overall population of the parish, which adjusted the ideal. If you'll go back to the prior, without redacting that, the ideal was 2613, but redacting out those inmates, the ideal is 2561. So that's our target, trying to get those districts as close to 2561 at least – uh, plus or minus five. Now, drawing plans. Individual, we, we met with individual members of both school board and the parish and small groups. Um, just, again, not violating any open meetings law. I'm very sensitive to that. <laughs> I helped draft it when I was at the legislature years ago. But you meet with them because, first of all, to inform them of where the problems are and what their options are. Which direction can you go? Um, and, you know, District 1, for example, can't really go east, right? There's nowhere to go, go east. Uh, 
So you look at what those issues are and get input from those members because as the elected representatives of those areas, they have a really good knowledge of what areas make sense to be together and what areas would not make sense to be together. Because sometimes you're drawing these numbers and if you have an option of putting geography A in a district or geography B in a district, those elected officials are going to have a better intuition about which one of those makes sense, which one of those best fits within that district. So that's what we basically did. And we also walked through the various guidelines that, that you have to follow when you're drawing the plans so that the members understand it. Because ultimately, you know, part of what they were elected to do is to make this decision. And, and it's a very important decision because it impacts representation for the next two or three terms. And so we try to make sure that they have a good understanding of that and look at what options are and use the knowledge they have of Plaquemines Parish that I could not possibly have uh, to help formulate at least options for a way to solve this population issue. Now, the, again, so the districts have to be within plus or minus 5% of that ideal. That's, that's our goal. The state law says you're required to use whole precincts, but and these were precincts that were set, locked in by the uh, council back in 2019 that then were submitted to the Bureau of the Census. That's what they used to create the census blocks. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But basically, think about it in a puzzle within a puzzle. So you have the parish, and there's a, the puzzle pieces of the districts. Within the districts, the puzzle pieces are the precincts. Within the precincts, the puzzle pieces are the census blocks. So it's, it's like those, you know, those Russian dolls. <laughs> and um, so the census actually reports the data not, I mean, they, they report it at that census block level. And so that's why those uh, precincts had to be locked in place so the Census Bureau could draw the census uh, blocks. And you'll see a little earlier, sometimes the, the manner in which they draw census blocks makes no sense. But, you know, it is what it is. Uh, now, that, and that's important because census block is the smallest size geography that we can move. We cannot split a census block. And sometimes that makes it very difficult to draw the line where it might make more sense because you can't. Because that, that where you want to draw it would have to split a census block and you simply cannot do it. It won't be accepted. So uh, as Mr., uh, Dr. Gooey had explained, the history in Plaquemines has been the police jury, I mean, uh, the council and the school board have traditionally had identical plans. Again, nothing in law requires that. Y'all have historically done it. Um, it I've, I've, I've done jurisdictions all over the state. Some do it like this. For example, LaSalle Parish, same way. The police jury and the school board have always had identical plans. Uh, they actually are very close to finishing. We, I've already sent their ordinance up to them. They're going to have a they're actually anticipating having a joint meeting of the school board and the parish council and the police jury, rather, to adopt their plan. It's what they did 10 years ago. Um, but then there are other places where they have the same numbers. They just choose to have different lines. Um, so it's, again, they're make, the, your school board members and your parish council members were elected to make that decision, and we'll see how it comes out. Um, we actually don't have a dog in that, in that, in that decision. Uh, we actually, in fact, offer a discount if they offer if they do the same plan. If they do divergent plans, it actually costs them each a little bit more. So they get a discount off of our base fee if they have identical plans. Um, now, we also try to keep what are called communities of interest together. Now, it is not always possible to keep every neighborhood in one district. It's just not possible. But those school board members, those parish council members can give us a better idea of what makes the most sense. And sometimes it's not even recognized uh, municipalities, because y'all don't have any in Plaquemines Parish, sometimes they're just communities. You, you had reference to Ironton earlier. Um, nobody would want to split Ironton if you didn't have to. Now, Bell Chase, it's not a city. You're going to have to split Bell Chase, but there may be areas of Bell Chase where it's, it makes makes no sense to put that area of Bell Chase with this area of Bell Chase. Again, that's what we rely on the members for to give us that intuition. Um, now, one of the things you also do need to do is you have to consider the Voting Rights Act. Y'all currently have two majority-minority districts, that is, districts where uh, uh, black population is the majority within the district. Under the Voting Rights Act, to avoid retrogression, you have to make sure you maintain those two minority districts. Um, last cycle, there was a process under the Voting Rights Act called preclearance, where after you adopted your plan, you submitted it to the Department of Justice, 
and the Department of Justice would review it for very for that very issue as whether or not it was uh, retrogressive, whether or not it violated the Voting Rights Act. Um, I am proud to say that I participated in 32 jurisdictions last time, and everyone was pre cleared by justice because you don't hire a professional to, to advise you to do something wrong. All right, and and so I'm, I'm very proud of that fact. Uh, I think that means I did a, a good job there. So there was a, a Supreme Court decision back in 2013 called Shelby County v. Holder. In that case, Shelby County, Alabama, filed a lawsuit, Holder being then Attorney General Eric Holder, um, and they said that the list of jurisdictions who had to do preclearance in the Voting Rights Act was arbitrary. Now, give me, let me step back a second. Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act is a list of jurisdictions that are required to do this preclearance process. It doesn't apply to everybody in the country. Everybody in the country didn't have to submit their plans. Back when the Voting, when the, uh, uh, voting Rights Act was originally passed, basically states who had more of a documented history of discrimination in voting laws were put on this list. What happened is the, when the Voting Rights Act was renewed prior to 2013, Congress just left the list just like it was. They took no, they apparently took no testimony. They apparently had no evidence. They apparently really gave no consideration of who should stay on the list or should somebody be added to the list. And because they didn't, that was not a considered decision, the Supreme Court ruled that that list was arbitrary. Now, some people said the Supreme Court revoked the Voting Rights Act. They did not. The Voting Rights Act still complies. So applies. That's why I said retrogression. If y'all were to adopt a plan that didn't have Two minority majority districts, you're violation of the Voting Rights Act. Somebody's going to sue you, and they're going to win. Um, so that's that's a mis a misunderstanding. I think that's out there that the Voting Rights Act doesn't apply. It does. It's just that preclearance process no longer applies now. In because of the delay in releasing the census numbers, it's kind of good that we don't have to do preclearance this time because it's a sixty to ninety day process, and that would have sped up your timeline by a couple, three months, um, because the way that law worked is you actually had to vote on the plan, adopt it, then send it to them. I never understood why they wouldn't let us send a plan and say, hey, if we did this, are we good to go? And they said, nope, you actually have to adopt it, then we'll tell you if you're right or wrong. Um, like I said, I didn't have any problem with clearance because I was fairly confident in the advice I was giving to our clients. And uh, But we don't have that process this time. So. You still, but voting rights still comply, applies, and it is still something that we will have to abide. But like I said, I'm, I'm kind of happy we saved the two or three months. All right, census blocks. Now, again, oh, let's see. So did I go? Yeah. Oop. There we go. Next one. Okay. All right. So the introduction introduction of plans. Individual members will introduce a plan to formally propose a new new districts, all right? And again, by the council, it'll be by ordinance, and it'll be the same process as they would introduce an ordinance. They introduce an ordinance. It'll have to lie over, you know, the same publication requirements, and then they vote on it. The school board does it by resolution. They don't do ordinances. So each plan will essentially describe the districts. Now, primarily because the precincts are the official building blocks, they will describe each precinct, uh, each district by precinct. Now, y'all have a unique situation here. In a in a school board, normally, I'm, I'm doing a bunch of school boards right now. Plaquemines Parish Council, I think it's the only council running in the fall of 22, the only parish government. Ordinarily, I'm doing a school, like in St. Tammany, I'm doing the St. Tammany School Board. School board can't create precincts. But if they have to split a precinct to do their redistricting, they can but they have to split it along one of these census block boundaries that has that is visible, like a road or a pipeline or a waterway. And there are limitations on how many precinct splits they can have. They can only have uh, a precinct cannot split be split between more than two districts, and no district may have more than three split precincts in it. And that's a school board law. What a parish council can do is if they can't use a whole precinct, they need to split it. They can divide that precinct and create create a precinct. For example, Precinct 5 can be divided into Precinct 5A and 5B. The reason they are restricted from changing that exterior boundary of that precinct, though, is because, remember, these are locked in. 
These precincts, which contain those census blocks, are also the precincts being used by the legislature to do legislative redistricting, Supreme Court redistricting, Be uh, Bessie redistricting, PSC redistricting, all these. And so if all of a sudden the parish government would start blowing up those precincts, the legislature wouldn't know what they were doing. But if the legislature was going to use Precinct 5, and now you've just simply divided as Precinct 5A, 5B, the legislature is going to use the whole precinct. They don't split precincts. So they would just use 5A, 5B, which is the exact same as the old five. But that's why you have to do it like that. Now, because uh, the parish and the school board are both running, y'all have the opportunity where really the school board is not going to have to worry about split precincts. Wherever we would need to split a precinct to make the plan work, the parish through this precinct division process, and they can actually, they have a little bit more leeway, they can actually divide a precinct into two or more. I've actually got one precinct in uh, in LaSalle Parish for the plan I did for them where they it create, we created three precincts out of one to make the plan work. So what would happen as a priority is that the council would by ordinance adopt its plan and by state law, the precincts that they would have to divide, they would create those precincts in the same ordinance that they adopted their plan, and then the school board plan would rely on those new precincts. So if District 1 needed precinct 5A and District 2 needed 5B, so to speak. So that's kind of where, that's kind of how y'all will be moving forward. Now again, even if they decide not to have the same plans, to avoid the police precinct split issue, you could you could still go along the divided precinct. Now, you could divide precincts, and then you could still split those precincts for a separate, different school board plan. Seemed like it might not be the way. That's just not the end. That's not what I've gotten from talking to the members. I think there's a, a significant desire to keep it the way that people have always known it, and that is, if you live in District 1, you're in District 1. If you live in District 2, you're in District 2 for both, both bodies. Now, we'll tell you, some of you will find yourself not in your district. And it's and, and honestly, that is the that is the hardest decision for an elected official when they get that phone call and they go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You took me out of your district. It's like, no, I didn't take you out of your district. I just there was just no other way. We could we had to make the numbers work. Um, by the same token, you might they might get a call from somebody going, I can't believe they put me in your district. Uh, but again, that's something that always happens. Another thing we also hear is this is makes no sense. One side of the road's in one district, one side's in the other. Well, that's because that's usually where that precinct line is located, or that's usually where that census block line is located. And that there has never been a redistricting plan where that was not the case. Um, I always tell my developer friends, when you're going to build a subdivision, please put a ditch behind the last street. Something that the Census Bureau can use as a census block boundary, so they don't have to make the last street on that in the subdivision a census block boundary, which means the census... The people on that side of the street are in one block and the people on this side of this block because it makes it very difficult then to include that whole subdivision in the district and plan. So, like I said, the the ordinances and the resolutions will be adopted by the ordinary process utilized, utilized by the, the parish council and the school board. And because they, they lie over, you'll have there'll be the opportunity for them to review them. And we'll have the ability to take those plans, a map of those plans, and put them on the respective websites so that people can go look at them. All right, I keep mentioning census blocks. The red area in both of these slides are census blocks. And look at the one to the left. It's 321 people, and look how long it runs. Now, what that means is that entire census block has to be put in one district. Now look at that census block. It reaches from, and you see the three districts there, it reaches to three districts, but you can only put it in one district. So you've got to, and now it might make more sense to draw that line somewhere along there, but you have to include that entire census block in the redistricting plan. The one to the right is only 82 people, but it is geographically gigantic. And it, it was, and every time we're drawing, it gets in the way. Because there are so many places that you would want to draw that line that are not in that giant L-shaped thing. Um, but that just goes to show you it's not my fault. It's not these guys' fault. It's the census blocks. That's what they look like. It's what the decision the Census Bureau made. And we have to move all of that population at a time. So that's what makes it particularly difficult sometimes. Now, this is a working draft that has been created by me 
based upon meetings with the various members, and it's kind of a snapshot of the whole parish, um, you notice, uh, and, and really I didn't include the whole parish because the, the bottom there goes on down to the Gulf, the bottom goes down to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, it's the standard layout that y'all have traditionally had with District 1 being the East Bank District. Now, again, remember I showed you those numbers earlier where District 1 was incredibly low in population, but yet it was already the entirety of the East Bank. There is not enough, there's not enough population on the East Bank to make an entire district. District 1 will have to cross the Mississippi River and pick up population. No other way to do it. So, remember, these are those, these are the draft statistics. These are statistics of that draft plan. So, we were able to get all of the districts within the plus or minus 5. You notice in District 1, it says 21.79, but when you redact out the inmate population, it, it brings it down within that plus or minus 5. So all of them were able to get plus or minus five. That tells you have a you have a working draft that at least meets the requirements. Okay, this is not this this plan has not been introduced by any school board member. It has not been introduced by any council member. It's just a depiction of what could work, a first notion of what could work. And if this is the plan they decide to go with, great. If not, you can make you'd have to make changes. But when you make changes, you have to make sure you stay within that plus or minus five. Now. Just to give you a little bit more information, again, this is the map depict, depicting this draft plan. And I, I put a little notion, a little red icon, that's where the prison is located. That's where that 468 people get redacted from. So, again, said that District 1, which was the light blue, had to cross the river. We looked at a, very, a bunch of different ways to do it, but because those, there are a bunch of very odd census blocks up and down the river, one, one solution, potentially, is to actually have District 1 cross there at Base Road and go into and capture some of the base to pick up enough population to get District 1 to where it falls within that plus or minus 5. Now, it seems odd, but the notion was trying to make sure District 1 remained as its core at East Bank District. There is very little voter registration on the base compared to the density of voter registration elsewhere. But it is population, so it can be utilized to, to get District 1 to that ideal. Because there is no way to draw District 1 and keep it just the East Bank. It simply is not large enough. Even if you didn't redact out the inmates, it still is not large enough. You would have to cross the river. That's just, Again, that's just one way to do it. We've looked at some other ways, but because of those census blocks up and down the river, it makes it very difficult to reach in. Also, District 1 was one of the majority-minority districts. When we tried other ways to look, we came dangerously close to messing that up. And we, again, I'm not going to recommend that a plan complies with all the criteria if, it, if I don't believe it does. Doesn't mean that the school board or the parish council can't adopt it anyway. They're just not going to adopt it with, with me saying, yes, it, it meets all the requirements. So now this is this would this under this is district two under the plan. It had to retract a little bit. You notice the, the dark red lines, those are the lines of where the uh, district used to be. So it had to retract a bit, and some of that had to go, had to go elsewhere. But it kind of stayed that sort of right across the, you know, the horn of Plaquemines, so to speak. Are council members allowed to interject? Anytime. Right. Just want to let, because I have a lot of constituents in the audience. If you look at this map, I'm totally against this proposal, um, and we're working on a new proposal. So, in my opinion, this shows District 2 being almost a plus 3 deviation. We have numerous homes coming online, which is going to then put us back to where we're at now, which is about plus 15% deviation. That needs to be reversed. There's districts on the um, southern end that are minus 5, minus 4 deviation. Those need to be at the plus, in my opinion to make it one vote system. Well, and, and uh, Councilman Black brings up a good point. If, look, I will tell you something that I believe is an absolute truth. The census is wrong. It's wrong. It, it's, not, it's not an accurate count of every living soul in Plaquemines Parish. It's not even an accurate count of every living soul in Plaquemines Parish as of April 1, 2021. All right? Because, and it's interesting, I was, I was drawing a plan with one district, and we were looking at the map, we were getting in really close, and and we got to a census block, and it had a little zero lit up, zero population. And the, and the, and the, and the member was like, well, that, that, that can't be. 
there's a trailer park there. There's at least 12 trailers in that trailer park. And I said, the problem is, apparently none of them filled out the United States Census. So not counted. It is wrong. But it's wrong for everybody. And it's the numbers that we're required to use unless you go pay to conduct your own census. And although there's a provision in state law that allows you to do that, I've actually never seen anybody use it. And it's, not, it's the numbers that were used to apportion Congress. And it's the numbers that will be used to draw congressional districts. And it's the numbers that will be used to draw legislative districts and public service districts, Supreme Court districts, on down the way. Um, now, Councilman Black brings up an issue that if you know, and again, that's why we use them. If you know that an area is growing very fast and that there have been subdivisions that have been built since Census Day. Because again, Census Day is April 1, 2020. We're well over a year past that, okay? So, we're, I mean, we're almost, we're, we're, we're cruising into close to, what, one and three quarters years. So, if you know that an area is like that, then you may want to draw that district low, utilizing the 2020 numbers, the idea being that in reality, that, that district will be closer, but you still got to stay within that plus or minus five. Um, and and, and what, what it means is you would have to reduce the geography, you know, words, contract the line around that district in order to have less population in it. As District 3, similar. And again, one of the things we try to do is you, you make the changes that are, that are needed to be made without with, and disrupt as few voters as you can just to make it work. Again, this is not plan that's not been proposed. It's just a plan that we've been able from all the discussions to see would work. District 4. There's District 5. District 6. Now, District 6 is North Part and South Part. Let me show you. Again, this is when you run into those census uh, block issues. So, District 6, that's the northern part, but then it extends on down the river all the way to the southern part. And you'll notice it borders the green, which is actually District 8, which has very sparse population. It is It had to get huge. And, there, and because District uh, 9 below it was also small, District 8 couldn't go south. District 8 could only go north. So Danny, yeah. that, that that is that's where I am at now. That right. is correct. That's what I have now, right? No, no, that's this is in the working draft. It's it's very similar to what you currently have because we did like the red lines. I'm talking about just that yeah. cell. Which cell? The yellow cell. That's one cell. Is that correct? Yeah, that whole yellow. And and again, not all the yellow. I'm talking about just the cell. That cell right there. Is that a cell? What I, I don't mean by nobody. You mean census block? Yeah, I'm sorry, a block. Well, no, yeah, that's more than one census block. But that 321 census block is this one right here that runs all the way up there. So that's more than one block. Okay. Well, that well, that's that 300. That remember I showed you that 321 census block. It, it actually runs. It actually runs from the blue all the way up. So it it, it it's a and again it's one of those things where. You would, you would not think that would be a census block. Like, it doesn't make any sense, but it is. And you've got to put that in one district or out of a district. And so you have to be careful because if you put a whole census block in, it might bifurcate a district into two pieces. And that's the one thing. A district does have to be contiguous. I don't think anybody really ever argued that it doesn't. Um, uh, now, we'll tell you, contiguous does not mean rivers. Rivers do not, waterways do not disrupt the contiguous nature of a district. We have had state senate districts that cross Lake Pontchartrain. Um, I, I've done a lot of, uh, from Plaquemines on up, until you get to Baton Rouge, everybody is on both sides of the river. Everybody. Think about it. Plaquemines, Jefferson, Orleans, uh, you know, St. John, St. James, St. Charles, Ascension, Iberville. They're all on both sides of the river. Um, I actually had somebody ask me one time, that's crazy. Who would draw parishes on both sides of the river? I'm like, the river used to be the interstate 150 years ago. Everybody wanted to be on both sides of the river, just like everybody wants to have an interstate. Um, and everybody could cross the river. We've just changed the society, but that's what it is. Now, you know, Iberville might want to give their West Bank to Ascension, and Ascension might want to give their East Bank to Iberville, but I just don't think it's ever going to happen. So, and then District 7, which is one of the minority districts, again, it was already kind of down the river. But notice we're still seeing District 8. It's incredibly large. And I'll go back to the map in a minute. That's the southern part of District 7. 
the northern part of District 8. Look how large it is. That's just the northern portion of it. But again, very sparsely populated. You've got to figure out a way to get to that population number. Then you go down to the southern part of District 8. And then there's District 9, which again, huge. Now, it's funny, uh, Habo's not here, but he, <laughs> when we were looking at it, there is a census block out in the middle of the marsh with a one in it. I think it's hysterical. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it, you know, who knows? <laughs> uh, but it is what it is. So, and so that was the issue we had. Because if, if you'll look back at the malapportionment, let's go back to that malapportionment number. So you notice District 9 minus 17.87. So they were 456 people below the ideal population. Well, District 9 can only go one direction. That's north, which means it pushes into District 8. District 8 was already 227, but had to give up some to District 9, which meant District 8, again, had to go further north. District 7 had to go somewhere, couldn't go low, had to go up. And that's what I'm saying. So it just, there's this pressure. Now, then you start running into the districts six, five, four, three, two, where they were very high. So they all had to contract. Now, good thing, because you had all this pressure from the districts in the south pushing up. That's why I've ever said, oh my gosh, your district eight goes almost all the way to Belchase. There's no other place to go. It can't go, it can't go to, across the river to district one. It can't go south because it runs into district nine. And it can't go to Jefferson Parish. So the only place for it to go. Um, and again, and then you have the issue with District 1 because it's not large enough. And it, it actually reminds me when we did uh, New Orleans City Council last time. They had similar to these town hall meetings. And one of them they had was in Algiers. And I made my little presentation, opened it for questions. And the guy walked up to Mike. First question I got, he goes, it's about time for Algiers to have their own council district. And I'm like, all you need is about 25,000 extra people because they just couldn't do it, which is why the Algiers district always has to cross the Mississippi River into the French Quarter because they simply don't have enough people. Um, that's the situation that District 1 is in this time. It's going to have to cross the river because that's the only place that there are any people to get. Uh, where it crosses the river, again, is a matter of policy for, for those elected officials to make that decision. So... Again, this, is, this plan has not been introduced by anyone. It's just based upon some, some discussions. Now, adoption. Again, I said it's an, ordin an ordinance for the council, a resolution. Um, same requirements. Same as, you know, they'll enter, you know, at the meeting, they'll have public comment. Um, it'll have to be by majority vote. There can be minor amendments in the meeting. Just like, just like any resolution or ordinance, somebody can propose an amendment in the meeting and they vote on the amendment before they vote on the, the ordinance as amended or the resolution as amended. I will tell you, they have to be minor. Because if you start making significant changes, it gets very difficult. Now, um, again, I keep using New Orleans. Uh, one of the reasons we didn't even put an RFP in for, for that, the contract this year. We drew a half dozen plans in the meeting. It took six hours for them to adopt their plan. Six hours. Because every time they came up with an amendment, we would literally have to take the computer, go in the back, generate maps and reports, disseminate them to everyone, tell them what this would be the impact, and they'd vote on whether they want to do it or not. But it, it, it took a very long time. But you can do minor amendments. That's not a problem. But part of the hope is that if you get enough public input leading up to that, then what gets introduced is something that there really is a consensus support for. Now, two deadlines. The... By the charter, the council has to have its districting plan done not less than six months prior to the next regular election. The election is November 8th. That's why you May 8th is the council's deadline. The school board operates under the more general deadline in state law that provides that uh, the plan has to be submitted to the Secretary of State by 4.30 p.m., not less than four weeks prior to the opening of qualifying. So it actually pushes their deadline to, to June 22nd. Now, that's the deadline to get it to the Secretary of State, so you'd have to actually adopt it the day before. Um, but if you're going to have identical plans and the school board plan is going to rely on the parish plan, that, that's, your, that's your deadline. We are not shooting for the deadline. You don't ever plan for the deadline. You always have, you know, it's like those, uh, my, I have one of my sons is invariably, well, how long does it take to get there? Okay, well, if it takes 18 minutes to get there, then I don't have to leave the house until 19 minutes before I need to be there. It's like that is just a terrible way to plan your life. <laughs> uh, 
So, um, you know, or my wife. It takes five minutes to do everything. So the public input piece, and this was something that I think was important to the council and to the school board to, to, ha to have these. We had the first one at the Bureau's Auditorium um, back on the 4th. Um, we're having this one. We're going to have one more on uh, Saturday at the Point of Lahash Courthouse, very similar to this, at 11 a.m. We, we've sort of had them at different times of the day, different days of the week, so that hopefully anybody who actually wants to come see this presentation can. Also, these presentations are being recorded. They've been streamed live. Uh, actually, Sonia Duplessis with the school board says she watched me on TV and um, then or on her computer. And then you can also go back and rewatch them if you want to. Also, the PowerPoint, I think, by now has been posted on both of the websites. I know I sent it to both uh, the, the, the council and to, to Sonia. Um, they also have the two email addresses. I know there's a handout here if you, if you want to take a picture of it or if you just want to grab a handout. It gives you those two email addresses, one for the parish, one for the school board. These are email addresses where you can send in your comments about what you think ought to happen. And I think it was a, a good notion of having sort of this dedicated email. So that way, at the end of the day, when they close those email accounts, they'll have everything. And so you'll have more of the corpus. So then the members, the elected school board members, the elected council members, will have the ability to go through those emails and kind of see if they can get a, a notion of what is the consensus of the community on, on what we ought to do. Now, see, there's a glutton for punishment because he was in Buras. Everybody wave at the former parish president. He actually was in Buras, and he's here tonight. Glutton for punishment. But um, and another thing is you can also just contact your school board member or your council member directly and say, look, this is what I think. This is what I think the district ought to do. This is this is what I, what I, what what I neighborhoods I think ought to be in the district. This is kind of where I think the line ought to be. Now be be aware that sometimes where you think the line should be. I had this conversation with a Saint Bernard school board member just on Tuesday night. He said, well, can we make that line Michelle Road is is parallel to just move it over one to Michelle Road. And I showed him on the map, Michelle Road is not a census boundary. I can move it to the next road over. And he goes, well, that would work. But again, where he, where he in his mind thought logically the line should be was a place where we could not draw the line. And that's one of the things that, that's one of the things that is just a reality that we have to deal with. Like I said, they're all being recorded, and um, you can go back and watch it later. Um, so after the plans are adopted, we are required to submit them to the Secretary of State um, again, the deadline is 4.30 p.m. on June 22nd, which is four weeks prior to qualifying for the fall elections. We provide them to the Secretary of State. We provide them a copy of the ordinance and the resolution, but actually more importantly, we provide them what's called shape files. It's electronic files, mapping software files, because that's really the, the most accurate uh, vision of what's been adopted. Um, we provide those to the Secretary of State. Qualifying will open on July 20th. Election will be held on no November 8th. Runoff will be held on December 10th and then they'll take office in, in January. So that's sort of the timeline we're on. And again, we, we keep the deadline out there because we know we have it, but the hope is is that maybe we can get something done uh, March or April before before we run up against the deadline. So again, it's uh, the, the firm is Strategic Demographics. Uh, Dr. Bill Blair is the uh, sole member. He contracted with me. Like I said, we've worked together before. I've known Bill since back when when I was on legislative staff, and he's been on legislative staff for 25 years, and he is the state demographer. So he's actually been running around the state doing this for the state as well. Um, and they'll, he, he, has, he has got a very busy February coming up because if, if you're not aware, February 1st starts the special session where the legislature is going to redistrict. And um, the most important thing for them to get done is to get Congress done because we've got, we got elections this fall just like y'all. So they're under a bit of a time pressure too. And um, – They've got actually a whole lot more work to do because they have the whole state and a whole bunch of jurisdictions. And um, like I said, so there you go. Like I said, we have uh, – see, there's the – there's a, that, there are the, the email addresses for the public comment if you, input if anybody wants. And I'd be happy to try to answer any questions about the process. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, you're yeah. On, the, on the questions uh, um, so that the audience can hear. Uh, have have a Mr. Mr. Henry come up to to the microphone. That way we'll pick it up on the recording. And anyone else? Excuse me, Danny. Danny, you mentioned about the river and District One. Yes. Are you familiar with the uh, Ernest Johnson murder Broussard versus uh, Blackman Parish Council back in, in the seventies? Not, not. Well, that was that was a, a federal judge ruling that. The district not supposed to cross the river. I don't know if you read it or anything like that. 
Well, what is it? Was Are you it familiar with that? Yeah. What, and, what I suspect is the judge ruled that under the Voting Rights Act, you didn't have to cross the river, which, in other words, one of the issues you get with a voting rights case is there's a case called Thornburg v. Jingles from the 90s. And Thornburg v. Jingles basically said that if you're going to try to avoid to creating a minority district that should be created, you have to be able to say that it's not possible. And so the issue was if they were crossing the river or if they were to avoid creating a minority district, then that's not something they could do. But, but I've, I've drawn districts. I've drawn dozens and dozens of districts that, that, that cross rivers because they simply have to. Because the, and, and because you're, you're, what you're trying to comply with is that constitutional one-person, one-vote requirement that you don't have a district that has very low population but yet gets the exact same representation on the council. Danny? Yes, sir. Uh, and off the lead, the, the, um, in 1980, there were 27,000 people in the parish. And when uh, Judge um, Christian Barry, I think it was, made his nine districts, they said, well, one-ninth of the population lives on the East Bank. Do that and then do your other eight districts on the West Bank. And it just so happened that we did create minority districts. And I don't know what the requirements were back then, but that's how the nine came about. It was a numbers thing. And it didn't cross the river. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, the set, what happens is they lock in the precincts before the end of 2019. In fact, the deadline was they had, they could not make any precinct changes after December 31st, 2019. Those precincts are then submitted to the Census Bureau. The Census Bureau is collecting data. They then build the census blocks within our precincts. We don't really have anything to do with that. That gets built by the Census Bureau, which I've heard some people say that explains why they're so odd, uh, because they're coming out of D.C. But the and they they really are. Sometimes I'm just flummoxed, and 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 it gets even crazier. Not only do you have to follow the census block, but some census blocks are not visible, like it's not a road or a street. It's just a place that they chose to draw the line. And our restriction under state law is that if we split a precinct to either divide it to create precincts in the parish council or to split a precinct to make a school board redistricting work, we have to utilize not only a census boundary, but it has to be a visible census boundary. There have been lots of times where I, I looked at a plan and go, hey, yeah, that works. And then I zoom in, I'm like, that's, that's, it's not a road. It's not a ditch. It's, now, you can lose lots of stuff. You can use a pipeline. You can use a power line. And I can, and I can turn on all that stuff. It's, I mean, the mapping software identifies all of those lines. But there are times where a line is just nothing. It's just the square the Census Bureau decided to draw the line. And and so you have to go then try to find the next available visible boundary. But the crazy thing is, is when you go to that next one, you have to include that entire census block. And if you get in a situation where it's one of those census blocks that's, I mean, and census blocks can have zero people in them. There's plenty with zero. They can have one, two, five, seven, 28. 1100 there's no rhyme or reason um it was funny i was doing one one time and it was just one little census block tiny little census block and it was like okay let's just we'll just add that one little one that'll make the plan look nice and pretty and nice like a ge geometric shape we clicked on the census block and i looked at because 468 people i was like what and the member goes oh yeah that's that apartment complex little bitty geography it's an apartment complex 468 people 468 people who filled out since. So that's that's the we're sort of bound by those, and then by our state law, we're also bound to use the centrist blocks that are that are that are visible boundaries. Yes, in fact, um, there are jurisdictions that we did after the 2010 census, and so we still had their shape files, and so we uploaded them with the census, and it was weird. All of a sudden, I had like I had some districts that were. A crossing a census block. And I'm like, that made no sense. Dr. Blair informed me, because he's a state, he's state demographer, the Census Bureau believed they had too many census blocks last time. So they reduced the number of census blocks in Louisiana from roughly 200,000 to roughly 150,000, which meant they had to combine census blocks. So where you used to be able to draw a line, essentially they, they reduced the number of census blocks that we could use as a boundary by 50,000 statewide. Um, now, again, some of these are a little bitty. Some of them are 
geographically huge. And some of them are geographically huge, but with virtually no population. But you got to move all of that geography at the same time. Huh? Anybody can buy this caliper software from it's it's a company called Caliper. We bought Maptitude, and um, you can anybody can buy it. It's not cheap. <laughs> um, also, as I as I understand, there are some free mapping softwares that are out there, and people have used them. I think there's a couple of websites. Um, they may not get as granular detail, but I think you can get to the to the block level because again, that data is released publicly. The Census Bureau releases it's called PL data. That public law data is released to the public. Anybody can get the PL data. And what the mapping software companies will, they do is they upload it into the system that you buy. So you're getting the census uh, data. And then what you do is you then lay that data within the maps or within the parish or within the state, depending upon what you're drawing. And it and literally you can go into the map and you can literally zero in and look all the way at the, at the block level. I can turn on population at the block level. So that I, if I know that I need 185 people or 200 people to get me to that plus or minus five, I can look around for census blocks that are attached to what I've already done and figure out a place to do that. Um, and I can light it up by cent. Like I said, we try to do whole precincts. Now, in Plaquemines, because y'all historically had the same ones, normally what you do is y'all establish your precincts at the same time you draw your districts every time, which is why some of the districts have one precinct or two precincts or three precincts or four precincts. Um, now, I've got other jurisdictions where you know, St. Tammany might have six or seven precincts in a district. Uh, just because they're much larger and they couldn't they couldn't have that many that much population because there are other rules about precincts and it has to do with but it has to do not with population it has to do with registered voters. Uh, there's a state law with regard to precincts are supposed to have between I think it's 300 and 3,000 registered voters. If there are too many registered voters, they want you to make the precinct smaller. If there's too few registered voters, they want you to make it larger. Um, and then precincts sometimes get confused with polling places. Those are different. Polling places, you could have multiple precincts in one polling place. Where I vote in Baton Rouge, there are three precincts that vote at the School for the Deaf, which is right near my house. And, um, they, you know, when you walk in, it's like, okay, there's a, you know, in the gym, it's like, okay, if you're in precinct that, you go vote over there. If you're in precinct that, you vote over there. Precinct that, you go vote over there. So those, but oftentimes in the public's mind, those get confused. They think of them as the exact same thing. Also, for the school board members out there, this has nothing to do with attendance zones for schools. Zero. Nothing. Doesn't do anything. I get that question a lot. Yeah, I believe it's I believe it's been posted to the to both the school board website and the parish website. I know I provided that. I don't know if they have yet. Um, I, I, I know you don't run the parish's website though. Um, and if they hadn't, I'll, I'll check with them. I know I, I emailed it to them so that they could post the PowerPoint on there. Just I'm getting a nod. So. The map included, Sissy, is that, that the right? entire this entire PowerPoint? Yes, the entire PowerPoint I believe has been present has been posted so that if y'all want to just scan through it, uh, that that way you can and stop at whatever slide. And if you and if you want to hear the, you know, nice repartee, you can watch me as well. Yes, sir. No, and look, registered voter data can sometimes be important when you're trying to make a decision, you know, drawing plus or minus on census pop. But by state law, we're required to use the census population. You can't, in other words, you, I, I had, I've, I've had one person say that you should draw school board districts based upon the student population. You can't do that. That's what attendance zones are. Um, registered voter data, and, and registered voter data changes every day. Uh, now, we do have registered voter data that's being utilized by the uh, the legislature, and that that comes into play a lot when you start looking at whether or not something is or is not a valid majority minority district. Uh, because if you draw something that's 50.02 percent black, well, when you start looking at voting age population, you start looking at voter registration data. That's probably not a district that's going to perform as a minority district. And so that's put it this way: ten years ago, that had gotten you in trouble with the Justice Department. Um, so we'll use voter, voter registration data oftentimes to back that up, but but voter registration changes whenever it does. Now the legislature 
is utilizing some voter registration data. We've decided to, to follow suit and use the same data because um, Dr. Blair is using, using it in, his, in the other part of his life. And we actually have the ability, Dr. Blair can run a voter registration report on any plan and tell you how many registered voters as of July 1st of 2020, because that's the date the uh, legislature is using, were in that district. But I can tell you that that number is inaccurate because voter registration data changes daily when somebody walks in and registers to vote or somebody goes and moves. So the voter registration data is going to be constantly changing. And again, I know the census frustrates people. And look, I bet the folks in California are really frustrated since they're losing new congressional seats. People in Texas are probably kind of happy. Um, I was involved in this process. I saw Louisiana lose two congressional seats in my adult life. I was glad we didn't lose another one because it just means you have less impact on both the presidential election and in Congress because people think as electoral voter, uh, electoral college is based upon your congressional seats. So, but it is the data. In fact, I've even been involved in litigation in the federal judge. I, Dr. Brother was actually my expert. The federal judge questioned as to, well, you're not saying this data is accurate. He's like, no, it's not accurate, but it's inaccurate for everybody. It's, and it's the data we use. It's the data used to apportion Congress. Um, and it's the only data we have. And even if they had counted every living soul as of April 1st, 2020, it's not April 1st, 2020. People have died, people have been born, and people have moved. But you, you, but you can't do it any other way. You couldn't do it trying to keep, because every day it would be different. So what we have is we have census day, and we have a set of numbers that everybody uses, and that's what makes it equitable. Yes, sir. Um, I don't have y'all's, huh? I, I don't know. I don't have your number. I didn't do y'all last time. And, and I didn't, I, in fact, um, I don't, I don't, I don't have that data. I can try to find it. So no comparison was done between the two census? No, because this 2020 census is the numbers we have to use. Well, and again, it doesn't necessarily, and this is the thing is, and, and this is something I have learned from uh, in my career. When the Justice Department does preclearance, the Justice Department looks at retrogression and impairment of minority voting, minority voting strength. The Justice Department, under their preclearance evaluation, does not review one person, one vote. One person, one vote is something that is done afterwards, potentially by the federal courts. I was actually involved in litigation in Cameron Parish that had districts that exceeded the allowable population parameters. Now, it's interesting, the federal judge issued a really bizarre ruling. She ruled that the plan was not illegal, but she ordered the appointment of a special master to redraw the plan. And what we ultimately ended up doing was drawing another plan with the parish, because I was hired by a citizen who objected that their plan was outside of the deviation. Now, there are times where the courts have allowed you to be outside that plus or minus five, but it has to be an extraordinary circumstance where there's just no way to do it. There's no, and, and that's just, and, and put it this way, they, they, the council can adopt a plan that's outside of plus or minus five, that, and so can the school board. Um, I think it exposes you to one person, one vote, because you generally have a safe harbor if you're within a plus or minus five, because the 10% deviation has been established by the courts as sort of a threshold, unless there are extraordinary circumstances. point is that um, we can exceed, if history has shown, you can exceed the 5% deviation and still be legitimate. It, and, and again, I, I, just give you, I, I just give you my advice as, as the consultant. I think it exposes you to a one-man, one-vote challenge um, if you exceed the deviation when you could have done it otherwise. Again, 
nobody might file suit. That's like retrogression. Because you don't have preclearance anymore, you could literally draw a plan that was retrogressive. And if nobody filed suit, then it's the plan. Because all these plans are deemed, whenever, whenever the council do, adopts a, an ordinance or a uh, school board adopts a plan and the Secretary of State accepts it, once they do, it's presumed to be valid. It's then up to the plaintiffs who have to go prove that it's invalid. And there are multiple ways that they can attack a plan. One, that the plan violates the constitutional principle, one person, one vote. Two, that the plan violates the Voting Rights Act because it is retrogressive. It actually went the wrong direction. And actually, there's three. You can actually attack a plan based on Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act that it still impairs minority voting strengths because you could have drawn a another majority minority district and the population justifies such, but by failing to adopt what you could have adopted, again, that's when you get into the Thornburg v. Jangles uh, discussion, um, is, is you could have done it, you just chose not to in order to impair minority voting strength. So, and again, but I can't in, in good conscience rec tell you that a plan is is valid when when it does when it's when it's not on its face. Doesn't mean that they may adopt a plan and nobody files a lawsuit. And if nobody files a lawsuit, you just go on. But it'll be a plan that 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 they will adopt. Because again, I don't I don't vote on anything. The council and the school board will vote. Yes. Well, and two things. One, strategic demographics doesn't do legal work for the bear. For uh, a, we're limited to our demographic work. I will tell you that in a voting rights challenge, you would face potentially having an award of attorney's fees to the other attorney. And again, it depends on, I don't know who they'd hire, how much they'd run up, but that is a potential. Um, again, I've, I, you know, I, when we had preclearance, like I said, I was able to, because there, there were plenty of jurisdictions where they were like, well, you know what, I'm kind of tired of that whole voting rights act thing, and I don't think we necessarily need to have the same number of minority districts that we had last time. And I basically told them that that's your that's your pleasure. You can vote to do that. I'm just telling you, in my opinion, it'll get rejected by the Justice Department. I kind of like preclearance. I actually had a proposal that I sent to uh, uh, Senator Cassidy right after the decision came down. I wish Congress would have gotten their act together and gone in and said, you know what? Instead of imposing preclearance on a few jurisdictions in the country, I think they ought to offer preclearance as a safe harbor and basically say, look, you submit your plan to us, we'll put our stamp on it, and if we put our stamp on it, nobody can sue you. I think jurisdictions would use that, and I think it would be very efficient. But some people don't want efficient, so I don't know. When I'm a benevolent dictator, I'll take care of all that. <laughs> Any more questions? All right. Thank you all. Don't forget to get the handouts up here if you uh, want to get the email addresses. And if you would like to register, not mandatory, but register so we can get a head count. Thank you.